If you happened to read Friday's weekly email, I asked if you could recall all 10 of the commandments that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. And I encourage you to practice them to see if you could recite them one right after the other from memory. So I'm just going to take a little poll. Raise your hand if you think you could recite all 10 of them right now. I'm in good company. <laughs> Not worried at all. Now, I was laying awake uh, last night too late at night thinking, okay, I'm going to go through them. And there always seems like there's one or two that, that trip me up. Well, as we read the scripture, let's see if you can anticipate which one will be coming next. It, the scripture reading comes from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I... The Lord your God am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your mother and father so that your days will be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of this word. This passage comes from the time when Moses was leading the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. They have departed from Pharaoh and passed through the Red Sea. Do you remember this story? The Israelites had passed through the Red Sea to the Sinai Peninsula when they see Pharaoh's army pursuing after them. However, as the soldiers approached through the Red Sea, the waters come crashing down upon them and the most powerful army in the world was defeated. The Israelites were finally free. After that event, Moses leads the Israel south to Mount Sinai, the place where Moses had encountered God in the burning bush and where God called Moses to go and liberate the Israelites from slavery. Moses is taking the Israelites back to the place where he first met God and where God sent him to free them. And it is also this place where Moses would receive the Ten Commandments from God. Well, today as we examine these commandments, we'll see what Jesus had to say about them. And perhaps we'll get a little better understanding of their meaning to us today. 
you'll find in the New Testament that it was common for Jesus to get asked questions about the Ten Commandments and about the 600 plus other Jewish laws that were in place at the time. In Mark 12, one of the scribes, who are the teachers of the law, they asked Jesus of all the commandments, which one is most important? And Jesus says, you shall love the Lord, the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these two. Again, in Luke 10, a Pharisee, an expert in the law, tries to test Jesus. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus throws the test back on the Pharisee, asking, what is written in the law? And the Pharisee answers, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. To this, Jesus simply said, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. And then again in Matthew 22, Jesus is asked the same question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And again, Jesus answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, after saying that, Jesus says something else rather interesting that isn't in the other two readings. He adds these words. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. What Jesus is saying here is that the commandments to love God and love neighbor are the umbrella of under which all of the commandments and all of the Jewish laws fit. As I was pondering why Jesus might have boiled down the totality of the law down to these two rules, I remembered a time when the company I was working for issued a new employee handbook, and they had uh, rewritten the employee dress code to make it easier for people to figure out what was okay to wear to work and what was not okay. And they even provided lists. They had a list of things that were okay for the office, and they had a th list of things that were not okay for the office. You know, jeans are not okay, but khakis are okay. And yeah, you don't have to wear a tie, a button-down collar's good, t-shirts absolutely not. Well, their good intent fell very flat. The new dress code offered more detailed guidance. However, it only invited more questions. Trying to make things easier actually made them more complicated. And while uh, I felt so sorry for our HR director whose office is right next door to mine because day after day, person after person would come to her door and present themselves and say, is what I'm wearing okay for work? And she said to me a while later that she felt like the new policy had trapped her into being a gatekeeper for what to wear to work. Well, I can't help but wonder if Jesus, in providing his answers as he did, was avoiding this same trap. It's like Jesus, faced with countless questions, finally says to anyone who listens, let me make this easier for you. You're never going to remember all the laws. But just remember these two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love one another. Well, we're going to take a look at these Ten Commandments, and as we do, I think we'll see that each of them does fit rather nicely under one of these two umbrellas of loving God or loving our neighbors. 
And I'm going to run through these really fast. Uh, we could be here all day if I covered any one of the commandments in detail. I think even any one of them could be a sermon all on their own. So we'll go fast, so buckle up and hang on. I'm going to tackle the first two together. The first two commandments, you must have no other gods before me and do not make an idol for yourself. The Israelites had been enslaved in Egypt for generations. And the Egyptians worshipped a pantheon of gods. So when Moses arrives and tells to the Israelites, God has sent me to free you, they asked, which God sent you? And in this commandment, God is making it clear, I am your God. There are no other gods before me. So do you think this particular commandment falls under loving God or loving neighbor? Loving God, that's right. Okay, so let's keep going here. The third commandment also seems to fit nicely under the loving God category. You shall not make wrongful use of the Lord's name. Doesn't it make sense that to love God means to keep God's name sacred? It's about using God's name only when we really want to talk in ways that honor God. And one of those ways is not when you hit your thumb with a hammer and use God's name in a rather hurtful, angry tone. You know, I think that this is why Jesus got so angry in the temple, uh, as we heard in that first reading, is Jesus saw that these merchants and the money changers, they were performing their sales under the name of God. It was like somebody walks in with a pigeon and one of the keepers of the temple says, oh, this pigeon is flawed. You can't sacrifice this one. But we have these wonderful selection of pigeons over here for sale. And if you don't have the right kind of money that we accept at the temple, we'll go over there and exchange your money and then walk over there and buy pigeons. Got some really great prices on them. All the while, the keepers of the temple were sharing in the profits from all of the merchants. And Jesus looked at that and he said to himself, they are defying the name of God, the Father. And it made him really angry. Well, the fourth commandment is remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. Now, this one is challenging. Raise your hand if you violate this commandment on a semi-regular basis. Everybody's hand up? Okay. If your hand isn't up, pay attention when we get to that commandment about bearing false witness, okay? Well, you see, these first four commandments, they seem to fit pretty nicely under that umbrella of loving God, respecting God, honoring God, remembering God, as Herman spoke in the, the children's moment. Well, let's look at the fifth commandment. It is honor your father and your mother. You know, when we're young and growing up, it's, it's a lot easier to honor our mother and father, I think, at least it was for me. You know, they're the ones that brought me into this world, and they're the ones that are feeding me, and they're the ones that are ushering me around wherever I need to get, and, um, and they're the ones that are giving me direction in life, and it's easy to follow them. But as I got a little bit older, I wanted to start to exert my own independence and gain my own freedom and live my own life out from under their rules. I remember when I was 20 years old, I was getting married. My parents were just sure I was ruining my life. And I did not care what my parents thought in that moment. I was actually quite excited about the idea of getting out of the house, getting out from under their rule, and having my own life. But then, as I grew older and began raising my own children, 
I started to see my parents a little bit differently. I began to see myself in them, people who make mistakes all the time, but who are doing the very best they can and who need encouragement and love. And now I realize that each individual's situation is different and that relationships with our parents can be messy and complicated. Still, I think God calls us to fully love our neighbor, and that includes loving that neighbor who brought us into this world and that neighbor who taught us about life. Well, number six, you shall not murder. This commandment says that all of life belongs to God. God created humans in the image of God, and there is no way to accomplish God's purpose for our lives by taking the life of another. Loving our neighbor means not killing another of God's creation. Well, you're hanging in there pretty good. We have seven, eight, nine, and ten to go. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hand on that one, by the way. I imagine this one made God's top ten list because it's one that the Israelites struggled with a lot. And it's one that people still struggle with a lot in today's hypersexualized culture. It's part of the human condition to sometimes feel attraction to another person who might not be your partner or who might just happen to be the partner of another neighbor. But if we honor this commandment, we just might save ourselves and others a whole lot of pain and suffering and we'll love our neighbor as ourselves. Number eight, you shall not steal. That seems pretty straightforward, doesn't it? I mean, if it belongs to your neighbor, don't take it without asking. That's easy enough to do, right? It might be also wise to remember that Stealing might take on other forms, like wasting time at work, or when the clerk at the grocery store hands you back too much change and you say nothing about it and just pocket the difference. Loving our neighbor means putting their interests ahead of ours and doing the right thing for them. Number nine is, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. We're not supposed to tell lies about our neighbors. We're not supposed to tell stories, no matter how salacious they might be, about our neighbors. We're not supposed to take up bogus actions against another person. And though we might think we can get something out of a situation, it doesn't mean that we should pursue it if it harms another person. Sometimes our neighbor makes a mistake. And if we feel aggrieved, perhaps we should talk it out with them before talking with an attorney. Showing our neighbor grace where we can, that's how we love them. Well, you've been great at hanging in there with these, and we're down to the last one, number 10. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. I like to think of this one as the keeping up with the Joneses commandment. Recently, Tamara and I decided that it was time to get rid of our truck and buy a new vehicle that was more suitable for where we are in life. And so I got online and I started researching all sorts of vehicles. Carvana is an amazing service, by the way. Um, you can find any number of vehicles, any years, any miles, and so forth. And so I was online doing all of this research, all the while mindful that my neighbor east of me drives a really cool early model Corvette and that my neighbor to my west drives this really cool bright red convertible car 
And so it was easy to say, well, you know, why don't we get us one of those fancy little cars? And, um, you know, fortunately, I have a wife who helps me keep things real. And uh, she painted this scenario for me. So your three granddaughters are over and you want to take them to the Easter egg hunt. How are you going to fit them all in that small sports car? So it was an SUV for me. <laughs> Loving our neighbor means, among other things, not being envious of what they have, not trying to compete with them. Well, there we have it, Ten Commandments. The first four fall under the umbrella of loving God. Five through ten, loving neighbor. And I know we've zipped through these really, really fast. And, and we don't do them justice because each one is complex. Each one is deep. Each one requires a lot of thought. That's also why I think Jesus kept things simple. He said, look, you're never going to remember all of these things, so just remember to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you will do those two things, all of the other laws all of the other commandments, they will fall appropriately into place. These Ten Commandments made God's list because God knows that they are the things we struggle with the most. But here's the good news. We're going to continue to struggle with them. No, that's not the good news. But Jesus knows that we will struggle with all of them. And still he says, I know you can't remember these. So just remember the two, love God, love neighbor, and follow me. I'll show you grace. I will help you find life. You know, a short while after coming down from Mount Sinai, Moses leads the Israelites to the altar where they are enter into a covenant with God and where they share a meal together with God. This morning as we share a sacred meal with each other in the presence of God, may we also remember God's commandment to love God and to love our neighbors. And may we commit ourselves to simply do just that. Amen.